So our second session today is about the Two Moral History Project. So we're going to hear from Mary Cunningham, who is one of the interviewers and researchers on the project. And then we're going to hear from Michael and John, who gave their testimony. And I am going to step out and Breda Murphy from the Tomb Home Alliance is going to speak. Um, so thank you very much. Our second session today. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we would like to introduce Mary Cunningham. Mary is um, the one of the researchers who went around to the homes and uh, other places to record the testimonies of our people. And she will explain to you the, the challenges in that and the burden in many ways of <coughs> ensuring that everything we take and everything we put down is the absolute testimony from the perspective, not paraphrased, but actually recorded. Um, truthfully in the archive and that this uh, I think for us as a, an alliance as a group of people affected the most important thing is that this will outlive us it will be here for the next generation and the next so that when somebody looks at the commission's report and then they look at the testimonies held by the oral history project at NUIG they will see the disparity and they will see how those testimonies which people give in truth and in courage to the Commission were disregarded. So with that I'll hand you over to Mary Cunningham who will speak about the process. Okay, thanks very much uh, Breda and uh, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, I was feel very privileged that I was in a position to actually do some of the interviews. So far I've conducted 15 of uh, the interviews mainly with survivors, uh, people who were born in the home, and also two interviews with uh, people who were connected through their family, with people who uh, were born uh, there. So um, just at the outset, we were talking, I suppose, about the Commission report, and we heard Theresa uh, speaking earlier on about, I suppose, the devastation that she experienced after when the report came out and how her testimony had been uh, dealt with. And I suppose from the outset, the, the Tum Home Project really, uh, first of thing that we mainly stressed that this was going to be a survivor-led investigation, that survivors would have control at all times over their story of how it was going to be archived, how it would be published, and uh, you know in what way it would be published. And I think a major part, though, in doing that is to establish trust that the survivors trust that the project was going to do what it said it was going to do. So uh, I think part uh, to establish that trust, I took a lot of care and so did the other people who have done interviews for the project, a lot of care to establish a relationship really with the person before the actual interview was done. And that would have been done through phone contact, sending a letter explaining the whole aims of the project, sending the consent form, which is an important document um, again, which outlines the, the aims of the project, how the, the material might be used uh, by students, uh, how it might be published in uh, at lectures, in books or um, on the internet, or how it might be interpreted by artists in various ways. And I think we'll see later today what uh, the drama students in uh, NUIG have done uh, with, the, um, with some of the material. So, uh, the consent form, I, when I'd send that out, I would always advise people to look at it carefully and discuss it with family or friends so that they were clear on what kind of decision they were making. And then the interviews have been done in the homes uh, of the people for the most part. Um, sometimes that wasn't convenient, but doing the interview in the home, I think, did help a lot. Uh, in, again, in terms of everybody being relaxed. And also, I would have found that, you know, when people would be speaking and they might refer to their family and they'd point to a picture on the wall or, you know, it was just the whole thing was, I suppose, a more intimate experience. Um, I have to say, I um, maybe enjoyed, isn't the appropriate term uh, to use in that the stories were, you know, for the most part, they were sad and people were talking about 
trauma that they had survived. But I, again, I felt very privileged that people were, were kind of relating very personal details to me. And I think just in terms of doing oral history and doing oral history interviews, it's a delicate process in that uh, you have to be very careful not to trespass on the privacy of the individual. So a lot of it, you know, unlike other interviews where you might be seeking out as much information as possible, I think it's just the role really for the historian is to try and facilitate the person to to tell their story and to the extent that they are comfortable with or what that they want to do. So it's um, it's a delicate balance. Also, I think there needs to be awareness that when somebody goes and recounts, um, you know, a, a traumatic history, a, a events from their past that, that caused them a lot of difficulty, uh, that, you know, it can kind of trigger, um, you know, a, a response, that, <coughs> something that might have been buried in the past. And that, as Sarah Ann uh, would have pointed out, that uh, counselling uh, is always uh, made available. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I think also, while it can could trigger maybe some trauma, it can also be therapeutic in that you're sharing this uh, story. And I know a lot of the people they, that I interviewed, it wasn't their first time sharing, thanks to the Tum Alliance, they had the platform here and the opportunity to share already with people. But um, again, you recognize that it's therapeutic, but I think the historian has to make sure that they don't become a therapist in, in the interview, that your role really is to hear what people are saying and to record it. Um, uh, for, the, for posterity. So uh, what I'm trying to get across is that it's a fairly delicate balance that has to be maintained. Um, just to follow up then on, say, following the interviews, uh, I would have, uh, getting back to the process, um, I would write a transcript of exactly what was recorded on the day and send out that transcript then to uh, the um, interviewee where there's an opportunity then to decide that you know you want to take out something or in some cases people have said oh I didn't say such and such and they want to add something and that's fine as well and once that's agreed then that they, they, they're happy with that transcript it would be sent to the um, uh, archivist Barry Houlihan and I worked very closely with him because he would go through uh, the, the transcript as well and prepare it for um, publication on the website uh, from the Tum Home uh, Old History Project. And again, so that everybody knows what's happening, we, I would get back then to uh, the person and tell them that it's about to go up and would they like to look at it. Uh, so in that way, now I'd be delighted to hear what uh, people who have I have interviewed uh, what their perspective on it uh, was um, that, you know, if we managed to achieve all these things that I've outlined here. But I think, uh, you know, we have striven to do what we set out in the beginning, that it would be survivor led and that it would be complete control. So, OK. And I think as well, Mary, that uh, survivors at any point could withdraw from the process is another important aspect so yeah. that or could um, post data. So you could mm -hmm. say, for instance, that my testimony can only be available after my death or um, at some future date. So mm -hmm. there's, the sensitivities involved are always respected. And that is in complete contrast to the taking of testimonies by the Commission of Investigation, which was set up by the state and which works to discount the survivor testimonies, whereas this works to this project works to enable the voice of the survivor to live to uh, survive and to go on for generations so that the truth will be heard and it will be heard in the first voice um so will i pass over to michael now um we are honored today to have with us a survivor of tomb who was one of the children adopted to america um, now, in the Commission's report, again, there was a document which was, um, which Conal O'Flaherty, who's a, a terrific journalist, a terrific supporter of those who have been institutionalised, Conal has written for at least a decade and has researched extensively. And he found records that showed that uh, 
those within the HSE themselves were concerned. This is around 2012 when they were doing research for the McAleese report. And so three executives, senior executives within the HSE in the Western region um, had written of their concerns to the minister. And um, one of those concerns was the amount of children that were being um, exported, for want of a better word, <coughs> that were being uh, shipped to the United States and Canada. And the Commission downplayed that. The Commissioners did not, in my opinion, investigate that appropriately. And they seemed to downplay um, any wrongdoing. So we have a, a survivor that can challenge what has been said on that. And Michael is a survivor from Tume and coming home, uh, which is what we spoke about earlier and last night we were together, um, Michael is actually coming home while, while he's home is in Boston. He was born in Tume. He spent the first four years of his life in Ireland and his story is riveting, really compelling. So with that, Michael, if you'd like to tell us of what you have found about your what birth transpired. and when you found it out, when you found out about being a tune baby. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank you and this group. Um, I'm probably going to be emotional and probably need a tear or two shed, but it's great to have the support. Um, I've been by myself in Boston. There's no one else that had my experience. So to be able to chat with you and joke with you folks means a lot. Um, I was born James Patrick Owens, 1957. And to my knowledge, I spent only a year, uh, excuse me, one week here in Troom where my mom, birth mother took me directly and I was the same day checked into Temple Hill in Dublin where I spent four years until I was adopted in 1961 over to Boston. I have a brother who was adopted prior to me, who's two years younger than me. He was a year old when he came over to Boston. And we've obviously grown up together in a good environment with loving parents in the Boston area. I've always knew that I was born in the town of Troom, Ireland. I always knew I was an adopted child, but I never knew the circumstances. I didn't find anything out until 2017 when a lot of this was all breaking and finally showed up in the American papers. And I thought I needed to make a journey over here to try to find out what transpired. I went to the GRO and found my birth cert. And on that birth cert, it mentioned St. Mary's of Chum. And bang, a big bell went off in my head and go, oh my gosh. I need to do more research, and um, and from there, you know, I spent a lot of time um, digging with a lot of help from different people here that I met immediately on the Facebook, on these private chats and so on that steer me in the right direction to be able to follow through on my own search. Um, I came the following year, 2018, and met some wonderful people at a book um, signing, uh, Pat Duffy, among others, and um, it's just it kept on opening up new windows and what the term I would say the bullet I dodged by being adopted to a loving family in in Boston and then because of the stories I heard of the folks who were adopted or fostered out here in Ireland and, and all your stories it's just it's overwhelming that I've it's hard to say that I'm a lucky man, but I think I am. Um, I didn't mention, but I was also born with a deformity. And I think that's also, I can't prove it, but could be from what medications my mother was given during my birth. Um, there's records of that, but again, medical records, none of us have. I'd love to have my mother's medical records, maybe to see what she went through and because of what she went through, what I was born with. Um, my adoptive parents put me through six years of corrective surgeries in Boston's Children's Hospital. World renowned orthopedists and uh, the best of care. Um, to this day, I still have handicaps which prevent me from walking long distances and so on, but that's a small price to pay for, you know, 
the wonderful life that I was given in the Boston area. Um, I was privileged to get documents that go back to the 60s with correspondence from the nuns to my mother, my adopted mother, and all the records that accompany that through Catholic Charities out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in that, I have documents that every one of you here would love to have your own of. Um, they list my mother, my birth mother, they list my birth father, their occupations, their ages, and what their trades were at the time that they had me. Um, these documents I just got in May of this year. So this is so fresh you know, to me as far as um, revelations, if you will, of what um, everyone here is trying to get. So um, I feel privileged in being able to have those documents, but also wishing that all of you could have the same. Yeah. So again, um, it brought me up to where we are today. And with the help of Brita, um, tomorrow I'm going to visit relatives for the first time. Oh. So, On your mom's side. Yes. Yeah. And but it's second cousin. It's, it's the only relative I have that I know of here in Ireland. But, you know, it's great to be back home. You know, be acknowledged to be a fellow Irishman, you know. And, and I may I, sound like an American, but I'm <laughs> Irish. <laughs> and there's another aspect I'd, I'd like Michael to tell you, um, which is unusual. Michael's mother emigrated at some point, and Michael came across her, her grave. And I did yeah. tell you about that. Yeah. Um, back in 2018, while we were digging through all this, I have a niece who lives in Philadelphia. And I received some documents when I first was alerted through Tesla. They introduced me to my second cousin and his, and his wife, Maureen, who have been wonderful. And they sent me documents, and one of them was my mother's birth, um, death cert. And on that death cert, it listed where she lived and the funeral home that took care of her arrangements and so on. I found her in an unmarked grave in Philadelphia. Um, the grave was donated by some kind soul in the Philadelphia area. I bought her her own tombstone, which I have a picture of here to try to honor her and to give her some final peace. So. And Michael, you do mm. not know why your mother emigrated. No. There may have There's been a time. There's still lots of mysteries. Yeah. There may have been a time when, when Michael's mother somehow knew that you had gone abroad to the States. Yeah. And it may have been in search because we sometimes have stories and we have them in my own family of a mother uh, going to Manchester and her son actually being in Birmingham and possibly having, he drove a bus in Birmingham. And he has often said, well, maybe my mother was on a bus without I ever knowing. Yeah. Um, that's what I think is so sad, is the forced separation of family. And when you try and recover, and you're our age, this happened in our lifetime. Um, when you try and recover and retrace those steps, you're doing it in honor of people who weren't afforded the dignity or respect, not just by church and, and state, but by uh, communities. And within one community that I've only, uh, again, it's a person who was, um, who was adopted uh, to Chicago, and it is from our own community. And I've learned in the last week that the community very much um, wanted uh, the child. The, you know, the child, they had no say. And that child, unfortunately, um, passed away feeling unloved on the 10th of October this year in Chicago. And his daughter has been the person reaching out on Facebook so the stories are heartbreaking. She, she wrote on Facebook that she never doubted the love he had for her mother and her brother and herself. But she said, I just wish he could have learned to love himself because he always carried the feeling of being unloved and unwanted from Ireland. So these stories are heartbreaking. And that's what's missing from the Commission's report is the heartbreak, is the trauma when they look and many times it's professionals who are looking and uh, you know and, and dictating and Irish society was dictated to and in many respects is still dictated to because we've begged 
I have sat in front of, of the minister and I've asked him most recently with survivors and with families of the lost children to please not have an agency oversee the works of Tume because when the agency steps in, as the commissioners did, they will dissolve and there are no answers. <coughs> they are not answerable to us. Whereas the coroner, if the coroner is appointed, well, the coroner is naturally appointed now. And if Galway uh, County, uh, County Council are responsible, we have some way of holding them to account. If not ourselves, then through the Public Accounts Commission. But we cannot, um, we cannot do so if the agency is appointed, and it looks like now it will be. So um, with that, will I hand over to a wonderful Limerick man, John Egan. Uh, and John, like many others, has found out, uh, has waited many decades to find the truth, has looked for it. And in recent years, there has been an uncovering or... Uh, significant revelations so that two slits like peeling an onion you get certain parts of the information and then you get updated information and then you get pieces again so among those pieces and I think one of the things John you'd said to me at one point you uh, your wife and your daughter had gone to Tusla and they sat in front of um, a social worker and she had in front of her <coughs> John's um, John's copy book from school and um, all of us like to see we like to look back at what we had when we were children and so John wanted to have it to look at his copy book to hold his copy book and his daughter wanted to and they weren't allowed that and that to me was cruel um, and the other thing which John will tell you about is that then learning after being a child a, a child a lone child with, with no siblings, he learns that he has a sibling. And she is here today. And she grew up thinking that she did not have a brother. So their reuniting is something joyous. And then John gets more information, which shows that maybe John would not have been among us, but would have been over stateside with Michael and would have been coming back with a story similar to Michael's. So, John, when did you first go to Tusla? Uh -huh. I'd say... I wrote, I'd say, I'm looking for the last 40 years, and 40 years at least, writing to Galway County Council and uh, getting back letters saying that they had no information. And uh, I was a long, a long time, I didn't see my birth cert until I was getting married. Yeah. That was my first look at my birth cert. I didn't even know where I was born or anything until that time. And. Uh, you saw your mother's name then for I saw the first time. Name, yeah, Kathleen Egan, and uh, that she was um, that she was a uh, um, domestic in in, in uh, they said she was a domestic in Lachray, that she was at, worked as a domestic in Lachray, and that was the first time I saw my mother's name, and uh, that went down for years. I was writing to them all the time and trying to get a bit of noise and get a bit of information, but there was nothing coming. So eventually I got through to Tosla. And uh, I met um, Anya Bork, and uh, she arranged a meeting, like uh, we had to sign all the confidentiality things before and before I could meet up with her. And that took time, but uh, eventually I met up with her, and uh, uh, myself and my wife went the first step. And uh, she had the file. She was sitting across from us. She had the file. She had the file there. And uh, she, she'd just flick, she'd flick through the file. And it was like as if she was, um, from the, the information I was getting, I knew like that things weren't in chronological order, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because I know that whatever happened, like it didn't happen. Uh, the, I know time. by the pages that. There was bits taken out, and I, I know there was things missing, like. But um, I wanted to have a look at the file, and she, she wouldn't let me see the file that day. But we got to see the file again another day there. We had a, a look at it again. My daughter was there the second day. And uh, we got to look at it that day. But I asked her about um, 
there used to be a, a children's officer who used to come out that time uh, out to visit, you know, when you were boarded out. I was boarded out, I wasn't adopted. I was boarded out. And the children's officer would come every so often to the house to see where you were uh, being kept. And uh, they checked the room and all that. But um, sometimes I wouldn't be there when she'd come, like. And uh, what was put down for that uh, was um, I was looking after my foster mother's uh, brother. He was living in Woodford. And I used to be going visiting him. I'd cycle about 28 and a half miles to visit him. And I was doing that for years. But I'd cycle the 28 and a half miles, spend a week there, and come back again, back to Gart and was working on the farms and all that. There was, it was all unpaid labor, like. But uh, what she put on, when she was doing the report, what she put on was, John was gone on holidays. John was on holidays. That was, that was the comment for my absence, mm -hmm. that I was on holidays. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I Sarah, John, would you work with your uncle then when you visited them? Oh, I did, yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. yeah, I did, I did the farm work, like. And, well, labor, yeah. there's a big book there if it could be written. Mm. Was, uh, yeah. um, eventually I got to... Uh, what is it? Um, that, that went on for a good bit. And uh, then um, I decided to do uh, DNA to see if it might throw up something. And I put my, I got the DNA done, and I, I, I it was out there, and uh, I, I have no, I have no good with computers or following anything to do with DNA or, you know, uh, setting up anything. So I asked Catherine Carlos would she help me with the DNA, and she agreed to do it, and I gave her access to the DNA records. And about 12 months after that, she came, she rang me one day, or she wrote to me. And she said, I think I found a uh, half-brother of yours. She said, everything points towards this man. So I said, that's great. So I said to her, where is he? And she gave me all the information. And she said that um, uh, it, was, well, it, was in my, it was in my it was in my remit then to look after that. So I left it go, I left it slide because I was tired of I was tired of, we say, looking for information and tired of, of, of uh, getting nothing back. Frustration. And, yeah, yeah. I, was, I got tired and I used, to, I used to forget about it sometimes. I just said, I just can't do it anymore. So eventually, one day we were here at a meeting, and uh, the meeting was over fairly early. So I said to my wife, we'll go for a drive. And uh, she said, where are you going? And I said, uh, oh, sure, we'll see you where we go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we ended up in Sligo, <laughs> in Tubbukhuri. Oh, yeah. He was, my, my half-brother was in Tubbukhuri. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had the address and everything, and I went to the house, and uh, he came to the door. My half-brother, Luke is his name. And uh, I asked him if I could... Uh, Talked to him for a minute and he said, no problem. I said to him, can I come in? I explained who I was first before and then he said, can I come in? And he said, you can. So we went in and we sat down in, in the couch. And uh, I explained to him what I was doing and why I was there. And uh, when we were finished up, or nearly finished up, I said to him, uh, I'm sorry you know, if I upset you or anything like that. I said, I didn't, that's not my intention. I said, I'm sorry if I caused him any any distress or anything, he said. I said, I said, I'm probably in the wrong place. And he looked across like that at me and he said, maybe you're not. Yeah. That was the comment he made, maybe you're not. So I said to him then, could my wife come in for a minute just to say hello? And uh, he looked around the house, his kind of house, he was a single man on his own. He looked around the house and he thought it wasn't tidy enough, but I said, she, my wife takes no notice of anything like that. So he said, no, he said, I'll take her to the graveyard. Oh. He took me to the graveyard in Rue, which is up, up, mm. up, up overhead, um, Tobacco, mm. and he showed me all the graves of all, the, all my 
relatives. Yeah, my mother and and uh, uh, grandparents. Grand, grandparents and the whole lot and brothers and sisters wow. and uncles and aunts and all the rest of it. So I brought him back back to his house again. Then we spent about an hour in the graveyard going around and I took him back to his house. And I heard no more from him. I left him all my details. I heard nothing for about 12 months. And uh, one day, Anya Bork, she rang me again and she said to me, did you ever hear from Luke? And I said, no, I've heard nothing from Luke since. She said, uh, do you mind if I try? And I said, you're welcome to try. So I gave her the details, the name, address, and all that. And she, uh, about two weeks afterwards, she rang me and she said, I made contact with Luke. And uh, he's willing to meet you. In, uh, I, I said, if, if we were meeting, we'd meet in Merlin Park. Mm. And I also said to her, when you were, if you do me, if you do get, if he does come in touch with you, or if he does respond, can you find out will he do DNA? Because I wanted to make sure that I was in the right place this time. Because I had yeah. been, I toast put me on the wrong track at one stage. Okay. They put me in track for a man in England. Okay. In Skegness in England, and it turned out he was the wrong man altogether. Yeah. But anyway, uh, she said, yeah, he's agreeable to do with the DNA. Mm. So she organized all that, and she, I said, we'll do it in your office because I want to make sure that mm. we were both there, mm. that it couldn't be anyone else who was doing it. Yeah. Mm. So uh, the DNA came back, and they said that we, are, we were half-brothers. Yeah. So just as we were finishing up doing the DNA and all that stuff, uh, he said, uh, I said, uh, would, you, would you come down for a bit of dinner or something? He said, no. I said, I have to meet someone in Galway, he said. And uh, I'm in a hurry, so I said, fine. So he said, he stood up from the chair and he looked down at me. He said, uh, by the way, he said, you have a sister in, in Clare. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So I said to him, are you sure? I said, I am. So I said, uh, whereabouts in Clare? And he said, uh, I don't know, I can't remember. He said, whereabouts? So I think I thought maybe he was having me on. So I started naming off all the towns in Clare, like Kilrush and Kilbang, Kilkey, and all the whole lot. <laughs> I finished up with Scarf. And he said, that's it, he said, Scarf. Scarf, County Clare. Mm -hmm. I know Scarf like the back of my hand because I was going through Scarf yeah. two or three times a week. And we was in houses right beside Mary's house. I was in houses next door to her house. Yeah. Yeah. Without, so, ever, knowing. without ever knowing it. Like. And she never knew. And she never knew. She had a brother. No. no. So, That's a nice type of big story. So uh, mm -hmm. she's, I, I said, uh, I got tight tight there now. You had a sister. Oh, yeah. So I, I, he told me I had a sister. So I said to her, I brought in, I said, uh, you keep in touch with Luke and you get the details and <coughs> so on. And uh, eventually he, she came back to me and she said that, uh, yeah, that uh, he, he, he gave her the details. And uh, he had met Mary 20 years ago before. My God, and he never he told He had met you Mary, he never told me. When you called him. Yeah, I yeah. stopped in his house and knocked on the door as well. Yeah. 20 oh years my before God. 20 years before that, exactly, yeah. The toaster thing. Uh, I got my file out, all right. I got uh, my file from them, like, but reading through it, I know there's a lot of it missing. I know there's bits and pieces, and then a lot of it is redacted. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. they tell Black you then that it doesn't, isn't re relevant to you, like, but um, it's, 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 it's very kind of, um, do you know, it's, 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 it's very sketchy. And tell me about when you got the photograph. When was that? Yeah, I got the. She rang me then. Um, uh, on your board, rang me there about. Uh, I suppose it's six months ago, or more. Mm. I forget now exactly when, but during the summer, I think it was early in the summer. Seventy birthday. Yeah, oh, that's right. But uh, almost, yeah. Honest. But um, she rang me one day and she said to me that, "Do you know? Did you know?" She said that you were uh, almost adopted to America. I said, I never knew that. And she said, you were. She said, everything was in place. The whole, all farms and everything were signed. And that, uh, I don't know, something happened that changed it all. 
but uh, she said that she wasn't the photo. They had the passport photograph and everything. Uh, everything was done. It was in black and white. But um, my son-in-law, uh, he put, put it into colour, colour for us. Colorized. There. Yeah. Has it no phone there. Mm -hmm. but, um, and it's beautiful. Yeah. These weren't attended to. Yeah. Um, I'd be a beggar on the street. You would be institutionalised, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry to be, say, yeah. for life. Yeah. We have one of our members who never left the institutions. Uh -huh. He's in Dublin now, and Tommy has given his, his evidence to Sarah Ann as well. Um, and it is heartbreaking because what happens is that you, you never get your freedom and you never get your independence and you yeah. never get skills of life skills. Um, yeah. So yeah, that could have been your lot. Yeah. yeah. Lot, uh, I have to be very grateful too that uh, my foster mother did take me out of Chum. Yeah. Because uh, she went through she went through a lot too, like yeah. because uh, I remember when I was only about eight, maybe eight years of age or nine. Um, one day, a cattle was a, her her cattle broke into a neighbour's field, yeah. and uh, then there was that time. Of course, people were very excited about if animals broke in that yeah. they were eating the grass and all that. Yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah. there was a bit of algae bargy like, yeah. and uh, I overheard the neighbour saying, "Sure, so you're only wearing a bastard." God. Yeah, I heard that distinctly with my own ears. Yeah. 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 And that's what she had to put up with, like. Yeah. Can I ask a question, John? You know, yes. when uh, Owen came back with this extra information to you about, um, you know, that you were supposed to head to the state. Yeah. Was that all, was that already in the file? Like. Well, it must have been. Must have. So yeah. she obviously then so took it out <coughs> and needed a little bit more. I'd say that. Uh, she, the, the way she covered it was, she said that, that uh, there were clear notes some offices and things, and that she came, they came across this, this stuff, but she had that all no, the time. I'd say she probably had it all the time. She had, and uh, she also, also put me in touch with, uh, um, they, had, they showed me a letter that she wrote from Skegness. Now, I don't know what they were making out, there was two Kathleen Egan's around at the same time, but yeah. This Kathleen Egan was in Skegness and she wrote back and she said it, it is an order that uh, uh, that uh, this child be adopted or something, you know. And she signed the form, her, her signature is there, like whether it's my mother's signature or not, I'm not sure. Like, but she signed the form and that was sometime in the, around, I'd say around... It could be the, around 52 or 53 mm. or 4 or some around that time, I'd say. Well, mm. you know, like it's a I was born in 51. Uh -huh. It's a different situation if you were born around the cross or down to if you were adopted to in regard to entitlements to records. Mm. Yeah. You were entitled to everything that you yeah. have because you were never legally separated from your family. Oh. Yeah. Whereas if you were adopted, you were entitled to nothing. I'm yeah. entitled to nothing at all. Yeah. So, but you were entitled to everything because you have never been legally separated from your family. Yeah. And nothing should be rejected. No. Yeah, it is all rejected. No. Most of the file is rejected, like it's, it's like it's. I take it. I took it down a few times to look at it, like, but it makes no sense. No. Yeah. And it, it's traumatic looking at it. Yeah. You know, yeah. looking at something that you cannot decipher and you yeah. don't know, and you're just told that doesn't apply to no. you. Yeah. You're entitled to everything. It's a, to me. It's like a tease that we yeah. know, but you don't know. Yeah. I'll tell you a little, but not everything, yeah. you know? Well, the you worst know? part of that, Michael, as well, is that as a, a, a child boarded out or without that background, you were only given a short birth cert. So if you go to the state for anything, including a driving license, you have to bring your birth cert. So you bring your small birth cert rather than the long That's one. Enough. And the person behind the counter knows. So you get a look. That explains I've from read them that, a lot here. that yeah. uh, you know you are. A sec we know you're a second class citizen. Yeah. It's not really a look of pity. It's uh, I don't know. Oh, you're one of those people. Yeah. 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 In this session, we have some further people to speak to you. There are two survivors, and there are two members of the alliance who are the families of the lost children. And uh, we will go first to Pat Duffy, who has spoken uh, earlier on on. Um, part of a podcast. Um, Pat's testimony has been recorded with um, Sarah Ann. And Pat, what we'd like to ask you is, what do you say for other people who have been in 
similar institutions. Do you think they should tell their story now? How I do you believe, think? Yeah, I believe everyone should tell their story because the great thing to give your testament to the people and let the world know what's going on in our country because the church and state, the church and state and the rich order are the cause of all what happened to us all. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, called about because my mother died of birth of me and because of what happened and my father was an old person and the cause of that because I was put in the tomb then because my aunt wasn't to mind me. As I told last night, I, my aunt wasn't to, or she wanted to mind me, but she had three sisters I had and they were put into Banislow for the convent. And I'm just married, I've just been married today now. It was a great thing she knew all about friends I have, and <laughs> Nan, and, and what you call her, see, what you call her, oh, well, really Casey. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's just great to meet all that, that's how we, that's how we know, by get, to get together, all survivors, those who were in institution and in adoption and all this also, should be taken, go and tell their story, and don't be ashamed. I'm not ashamed anymore. I was low, I was very low. When I came out of the room, I didn't know who I was, why I was, and I didn't know who I was. And I was, I thought I was dirt. I felt I was dirt when I came out, because people used to pity me. But I don't know why, they, I didn't really, couldn't understand why they were pitching me. And then when I used to go to school, I was never educated. And they ended up, they look at the creator, look, that's all you hear. But I want to be educated. I wanted a career. I got nothing. But when I, when I, I met my father from nine years of age, until nine years of age, until I um, was 22 years of age, and he went to the home and then I got very sick then. When my aunt died, I went down, you know, I lost him. And I, when I heard, when I heard my, when I heard my story, that upset me. I cried to her go. I did because it upset me. I want, I want more to get up. My, I, I feel sorry for everyone. I feel sorry the way we all suffered. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love kids, I love see little children. And I, I, I hate to hear children crying too, but that was, but that still, I, it reminds me going back years ago in June, the roars of children. And I was doing the same and I covered myself, put my hands up and put the sheet over me. But it was so hard, like, it was hard. And when I came home then, I had nightmares, I had everything, and I was getting terrible depression. I was trying to commit suicide before. I said, I was getting a rope and hanging myself on the tree. Because I, I thought I was no one. I felt that kind of way, like, well, um, but it took a long time for me to get where I am. And I think this is the best thing from going, when I started going to counseling, started meeting the lines, the group, all oh, the lovely group we have here now today, and that gave me, I'm, I have great feeling, I'm great lift, but I want more, like, because mm -hmm. I got nothing, and my, I'm only pinching on my pension. That's all, I'm, for 40 years I was on disability, because I wasn't to go anywhere, I wasn't, I, I wasn't to go outside the door. And every time I go outside, I start getting panic attacks. And it took 40 years for me to get right, and it took a long, and I'm very much, very pleased to my nephew, He's very good to me, and he stayed with me for twelve and a half years. And he used to say to me, "We well, have to fight. You have to fight." It. I went to psychiatrists. I went to everything, and I see a lot of drama because of June, and because of mind to my father, an old man, take him out of his bed, shave him, wash him, go and slaughter him, and do all this, and punish shoes, behind feed him, and I used to get up at three o'clock in the morning, up to four o'clock in the morning to mind him when he was roaring with pain. And I was getting breaking down. I was getting nervous breakdown now, that's about it. And then I put him into, we got him into Vanish Slow, Virgin of the Hospital. From there, the nuns took over and they put him into Lottery, the county home, which is in Brendan's home now. And I went to see him every fortnight. And I, was, I had to do everything on my, on my own. I had no help from no one. And that's, and, and, and that's, and I used to say when I was growing up, I'd love to become uh, an engineer or uh, a doctor or a teacher, but I never got those things because I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't, and that's the way it was. But I want to see every survivor all over the world 
to go out and fight for themselves. Go and meet these other groups and be, and we get there and fight justice, fight for our justice, for our rights. We were entitled to that, but we're not going to live forever. And we want what we want now, not tomorrow, not next year. We want it now from the government, and I'm fighting that the whole time. And we want to Facebook, and I look watching and when things go up. David, David Taylor, or David Kinson, and all of them, they put on out It's time now for survivors stand up together and fight the government, fight the religious orders, fight, the, fight anyone you could leave your hands on, because they owe to us. <coughs> Thanks very much. And now we have with us Christine, who earlier on when Michael was speaking and, and John, who may have ended up in Boston or in America. Christine, actually, as a child in the care of the state in a fostered out area, was sent to America. Um, and in many ways, the social worker did not want you to go to America. She fought for you to remain in Ireland. Yeah. Um, but the power of those in America to take her over was overwhelming, and you got there. I got there, yeah, and... Uh, How did they bring you over? When did you know you were going to America? Well, I knew all the time I was going to America, but uh, it was my foster mother and a social worker, Miss Edna McCormick. She's dead now, and I met her a couple of years ago. And she brought me everywhere. She brought sweets, she brought everything. She didn't act like a social worker. She acted like my mother. That's what she was like. She was so kind, you know. And uh, when I went to America, uh, uh, the couple were there at the airport to meet me. Now, I got a picture one time of a woman that was tall, and she was beautiful looking. And I, this woman, that, I thought that's the woman that I was going over to. But it's funny, and I'm going, the woman that I saw in, at the airport was a big fat slob in plain English. Now, and uh, I, I never traveled anywhere, and I went into the, the tubes that are in America, and there was a man there, and he was drunk as a skunk, and he threw all the whiskey on me. I cried my eyes out. And the only thing my, my foster mother, uh, the, this woman said was, shut up your mouth. That was it. I got no sympathy, nothing. No hope, nothing. And uh, I got to the house and everything. And uh, the only thing I heard every night and every morning was, she'd be no good. She'd be, she's only, you know, she's just like her mother, you know. And uh, they tortured the hell out of me. I ended up where I nearly had a nervous breakdown. But... You got out? I got out by this nun. She was a, an Irish nun. And she, I asked her, and she, she brought, got me out of the place. Only for her, I'd be six foot under. Because of the way, you know... You were treated. Yeah. Yeah. You were earning money. And you and, were bringing the money back to them. And then eventually, then when I was leaving, they let, let me sign something. Now, I didn't know what I was signing, but I kind of figured out after a while that I was paying for my trip over to America. Because the reality, we'll come on to the um, families of the lost children. And there are 796 children who are yet to be recovered from the grounds in Cheung, from the site where... Um, where the survivors were born and lived for the first few years of their life. And uh, two families are with us. Um, Ted Steed is now our vice chair. And Ted has lobbied with the minister most recently when we met him on the urgency to recover Josephine, his lost cousin, before it's too late and within his lifetime. <coughs> so, Ted, if you'd like to tell us what, what you know of Josephine's <coughs> life. Yeah. Hello everybody, um, my name is Ted Steed, um, I, was <coughs> I wasn't aware of, my, uh, of an aunt, an aunt Agnes, until I was about 15 years of age. 
And when I inquired of my parents about her, I was told to remind my own that she had died. And um, her name wasn't on the headstone in the local graveyard. So when I inquired a little more, I was told to mind my own business. Um, as a, a teenager, you didn't bother querying your parents too much. Um, I could see some anguish on my father's face, but uh, my mother wasn't aware of the situation either as she was born in County Calvin and arrived in Galway in 1943. My aunt Agnes was born in 1901. But anyway, uh, I'll move on to Agnes. Um, this is from the records that I found out and the uh, social worker that both of you mentioned here, Miss uh, uh, <coughs> she's in the picture again. She was the first one that I wrote to in 1984. And she answered me very politely and told me where I should make my inquiries. But anyway, um, my aunt got pregnant in 19, probably nine, late 1932 and um, was a, en entered the home in 33, in June, 30, in June 1933. Um, spent about a month there and something must have been wrong uh, health-wise as she was sent to the um, hospital in Galway, Central Central Maternity Hospital, I think it was, in, in Taylor's, in Prospect Hill, where the county buildings are now. Um, she spent uh, about two weeks there, gave birth to my cousin Josephine, and approximately six days later, my Aunt Agnes died in the hospital. And Josephine was sent back to the mother and baby home in Chum, where she uh, lived for three, four months. And she died in November of that year. I have her birth certificate, her baptismal certificate, her death certificate signed by a sister Hortonens, who seemed to be an all powerful lady for a long, long number of years. Um, it was, I went to England in um, 62, I was the oldest of seven, and uh, came back 10 years later, <coughs> married, and uh, we had five children. And uh, it was sometime 84, 85, and then I started making inquiries again about my aunt. Up to then, for was the 10 years that I was away, there was so young single fella, you had a lot of other things on your mind. So when I started having my own children, um, my Aunt Agnes came back into the picture again. And I found out a certain amount from the uh, Tuzla, but whatever question you asked, it was answered. And th there, there was limited in the information that was coming back. Um, I did get a, through the um, the hospital. I got um, my aunt's uh, death certificate and what she died from sepsis and a couple of other things. I'm not too aware, uh, familiar with the uh, uh, doctor's reports. But um, my own brother and sisters didn't seem to be too interested in finding out about uh, their cousin. So uh, even though I mentioned it to a few of them, there are two members of my family interested now. Um, a couple of my grandchildren know about it and uh, are happy enough to keep going along to find out more. We do not know of where Agnes is buried, or sorry, where Josephine is buried if she is buried. That's why I would love the excavation of the site for whoever wants to claim their remains, let them claim and bury their siblings where they should be buried. Um, I 
do put myself through a certain amount of torture at times when I, I did inquire again at a later stage of my aunt, you know, eight months pregnant, not feeling well, being brought four and a half miles to the home in Chum, and it was probably by bicycle if she was able to ride at the time. I did find out who signed her in. That was a bit of a blow as well. Um, I have seen, I'm delighted to be a member of this group for probably four to five years now. And I have seen and listen to their stories through the years and the torture that a lot of them go through in relaying their stories. And at times we can have a laugh over a cup of tea or whatever. And I'm privileged to be a member of the group and to know all the people that are here and a few that have left as well. But um, I will keep searching and do my best. I have gone along with, I've reported my Josephine to the Gardaí as a missing person. I have done, sent copies of my files or handed them over personally to the Minister Roderick O'Gorman on his visit to Chum last with Breda and Michael there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael. Uncle Hattie. And uh, so that's as far as we are today. You know, we did have politicians come and speak to us, yet the same politicians voted in Dáil to hide, hide all those records away for mm. X Up number of years until, years until we were all dead. They, did. they, they don't deserve to be here. Pardon? No. They don't deserve no. to be here. No. no. Saying that. No. They don't. No. I wouldn't vote for one in, in, in a hundred years. Thank you, Jimmy. I think... Uh, I've taken up enough time. Uh, yeah. people are getting Mick, hungry. would you like to speak Michael. about uh, the search that <laughs> Mick's, uh, Mick's case yeah. is, is quite unusual in a way, and yet it's not unusual for Ireland at the time because children and, and parents, and there were, Pat has spoken of it, of being born to a married couple, of having three siblings who were placed in the institution upon the death of his mother and of him as a child, as a baby, being placed in Shoom. Um, Mick's case is that Mick was actually reared by his aunt from a very young age, and his aunt had been a single mother, so the siblings were older, and Mick will tell you about, they were twins, and Mick will tell you about finding out about, about Mary, his Yeah, right. His aunt's um, yeah, I became a volunteer myself a number of years ago with the Shoom <coughs> people, little realising that it was on my own doorstep, you know. But uh, like a lot of other people, that happened to yourself, Reid, as well. But um, at the age of two, uh, uh, like I was born in, in Kilishka, Clare, Galway, uh, a family of nine, and, uh, you know, the family were pretty poor. Um, and it would have been common enough, it wouldn't have been unusual in those days where you'd have a big family, uh, uh, and then you'd, you'd have, uh, uh, you know, an, an uncles and that uh, would affirm and you'd hive off one to, uh, uh, one after big family to, uh, well, the, the, the uncle would be anxious to, to have the child in the first place and, and with the idea that they'd inherit the firm and the whole lot and carry on the name. And I was the same name as the uncle as well. So from the age of two, uh, 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 uncle and aunt, uh, uh, I suppose, unofficially adopted me. Now, my aunt had been a single parent 11 years before that, uh, and she had she had twins. Uh, and I, like I always knew that that one had died, uh, uh, you know, at, at at birth or thereabouts. That was the story. So, so right. Um, um, so, like, I just have a vague uh, memory of, you know, of the 11-year-old cousin, and it, it is pretty vague enough, uh, 
and she went off to work then when she became 17. So, uh, so I'm reared by, by, the, by the uncle, an uncle and an aunt, a brother and sister, I should say, you know. But um, a brother of mine then did some research and, and he was picking things up from his mother uh, as well. So this is the way things were. You, you, different members of families were picking up snippets and overhearing this and, 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 and that and trying to piece things together. But, you know, he, he'd uh, picked up from his mother that, that the family, that my aunt's parents, in other words, brought a case for maintenance really against the man that got her pregnant, which must have been extraordinary in those days. Mm -hmm. And this case, um, you know, was, in, uh, was recorded in the Connacht Sentinel at the time, the local Connacht Tribune, I suppose it was, yeah. you know. So, so I have a copy of, of, of that court case. Uh, and like it must have cost the, the, the family a, a, lot. A, a lot, because they ended up, they lost the case and they ended up paying for three sets of legal people. Jeans. Uh, yeah. A solicitor and a barrister, three times over their own. The man that, uh, that they brought the case against uh, for maintenance. And like he, he uh, implied that there was another neighbour, that she was having off with another neighbour as well. You know, so that man had to be represented, you know. Uh, now, uh, he, you know, that didn't matter to me. So, I mean, everyone, you can imagine, you know, the story that must have caused in the community at the time. Like, you know, you can just imagine what it must have been like. Uh, got pregnant, they were coming home from a wake, you know, a, a, a crowd of people from a local wake. And, and they testified that, you know, the words that, that the couple went inside the wall and, you know, and we know what happened. and. You know, I mean, it was pretty obvious. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and she, she swore, you know, people, the way people swore, if people swore yeah. on the Bible in those days, well, they were telling the truth, God help them. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether choosing their own interests or not. Yeah. You know, and she said this other gentleman, this other man was a gentleman, and that says it all. The man that they tried to smear, like, you know, yeah. which had to fight his case as well. But, um, but anyhow, I started rooting then in recent years. Well, you just, yeah, it was only about <coughs> three years ago then that uh, RT uh, ran a program on, on the homes two nights in a row. And uh, my cousin Mary that keeps in touch with me regularly, she ran me the second night uh, and, uh, and said about me aunt being in the home in June. And I said, you're not serious. And she thought I knew. That's, I mean, that's the way things were, you know. Uh, one had a little bit of information and I thought everyone knew this. Yes. Uh, but I mean, I never knew that my aunt, I never realised in the many years that she'd been in, in the home in two. Like I just thought she got pregnant the way people got pregnant and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, but never did I realise for a moment that she was in two. But, uh, but, but because the mayor says, oh, she was in two, he didn't know that. I says, I know. So she, I thought that's why you were involved. I says, well, I wasn't. I was just sympathetic, you know. Uh, she said she was in the home, you know, uh, and, and, and that was it. So uh, I often think that uh, she's spent the rest of her life there then in that community and uh, in, in a way she would probably would have been better off if she'd gone, if she'd gone, gone away or gone abroad and, you know, and, and made a, a life for her because, you know, she lived, you could say, a celibate life for the rest of her life, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Had it comfortably off, but, but not a normal life at the same time. No. But know. she lived with her brother um, yes. in the family home, but it yeah. shows the courage of the woman in the 1930s, which most mm -hmm. women, I'm, I'm sure she had the support of her brother because she did well, return she there, but yeah. to actually yes. leave with yes. the surviving child, to be able yes. to take yes. the child out of the home Yes. And then I think right. your family, uh, in, in giving you to her, uh, were doing a, another service because they were ensuring that the child did not yes. grow up alone. And yes. those who right. were looking on, it was as though you were a family. And you were very yes. real. You yes. said yeah. the surviving <coughs> twin. 
she is very much your sister. She is the one that you yes. were close to as you grew up. Yes, that's right. Yeah, like she's she's in her eighties now, and she uh, she has Alzheimer's, and she lives in Artane in Dublin. But uh, like she would ring me regular um, up to maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, two two years ago, uh, and uh, and it's funny. In the early stages of Alzheimer's, as if she was kind of freed up and away to, to say things that she, would, she wouldn't have said otherwise. But, uh, but, but she, 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 and she said the same things all over. She could ring me three times a week, and she'd describe me as the brother she never had, you know, and that she, she was lucky she didn't open a home, like, and, and all this, like, but she, I mean, she wouldn't have said that no. before that, but now I suppose, yeah. but, 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 but God help her, like, she's not able to ring me anymore now, but, uh, but yes, yeah, she's still, she, she, you know, she, she, she's still alive there with, with Alzheimer's. But, uh, but as I say, I found the, the two, the birth That's certs for the twins, but there's no, um, death there's cert. no death cert. So, you know, so I mean, that's the conundrum. So there's one missing, uh, whether it's in the pit in tomb or in Overseas, America, where in America. God knows where, like that. So that's the. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that's it. So that's the. Uh, uh, just a, 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 a quick word, uh, just in relation to my cousin Josephine again. Um, in much later years, I did hear of true relations of the uh, Josephine's alleged father and um, neighbours. But um, he wasn't spoken about in our house. But um, we always recognised one another. I didn't hold, as I said, it was only alleged. And uh, he died as still a single man, never got married. Yeah. And um, his son mm. went to school with, or uh, sorry, his nephew went to school with me. and. Uh, there were other members of his family that went to school with my family, you know, yeah. so we never held it against anyone, you know, no. nor they against us. So I'm glad it just carried on that way in yeah. the generations. Yeah.